Lewandowski calls what I'm about to tell you filling the gap, but I've also heard it referred to as replacing a load-bearing wall. So you need some kind of metaphor to make sense of it. Personally, I prefer replacing the leg of a table because I like to imagine people's mental modules are sitting on tables like they have in war rooms with toy soldiers, toy tanks, you know, sticks pushing it all around. And if what you're suggesting to someone makes them think that they must give up something as fundamental as a leg of that table, then you must swoop in immediately with a new leg if you have any hope of that person accepting your proposition, because they simply can't allow that whole model to fall over and collapse. If you don't do this, if even over the course of the conversation it becomes extremely obvious to a person that they're wrong, the threat of decoherence will not allow them to accept that wrongness. My favorite example of this, my absolute favorite, is this study from the early 1990s in which people read about a warehouse fire. Now, it was totally made up. It was absolute fiction. But these people, they were asked, based on what they had read in that story, what they thought might have caused the fire. Now, one group's story mentioned that there was a closet in the factory that contained paint cans and gas cylinders. Now, the other group, though, they read that story and it didn't say there was anything in that closet. It actually said that that closet was empty. Later on in the story, if it had mentioned those cans and cylinders, there was a correction, and that correction stated that they had been incorrect. There was a mistake. The closet was, in fact, empty. When scientists asked the subjects in these two different groups why they thought the fire produced a great deal of smoke, the people who read about the full closet that they later learned was empty, still cited those non-existent paint cans as the cause. Except there was no oil paint, because the cupboard was actually empty. Some even said that the stuff in the closet caused the entire fire, not just the smoke. What they don't say is, I don't know. They can tell us that they know it's wrong, but it's much, much harder for them to, to actually fix their situation model. Because how do you represent the event now when all of a sudden a key causal piece of information is gone? And of course, the people in the other group who never heard the misinformation, they had other ideas about the cause. And, you know, they never mentioned paint cans because why would you? It's an odd item to conjure up. But here's one of the most amazing things I have ever learned in psychology. When you add a third group to this experiment and you give them that same correction, yes, I know I told you the closet had paint cans in it, but actually that turned out not to be true. But you also tell them that there was a room containing lighter fluid and old rags. People never mention the paint cans. Never again. They easily, freely, and without resistance give up that misinformation and replace it with the better explanation instead. In the study, the authors say that once a person has created a causal narrative out of their logical inferences, that narrative will resist any change that threatens to cause the whole thing to fall apart, even if that means keeping the inferences that they know (laughs) are indefensible. So what we find generally is that when we correct a story that people say, oh yeah, I know. You corrected this. You told me the the cabinet was empty. Yeah, 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 I know that. But then when we ask them to make use of the information, they're referring to stuff that they know is false. And they rely on this misinformation. And this is called the continued influence effect, uh, effect. And it is pervasive. Lewandowski and Cook in the handbook, when they're commenting on this, they say, quote, People prefer an incorrect model over an incomplete model. In the absence of a better explanation, they opt for the wrong explanation. And that reminds me of this great quote by Bertrand Russell. And he said, Man is a credulous animal and must believe something. In the absence of good grounds for belief, he will be satisfied with bad ones. I mean, we have shown this in countless experiments and studies with, with, you know, subjects around the world. And there's absolutely no question that this is what happens. People continue 
to rely on information even after we tell them it's false. What makes the warehouse fire study so illuminating for me is that it is absolutely apolitical, devoid of all those confounding variables that come with our most deeply held beliefs. And people have only held these beliefs in the study concerning that story for half an hour. And it's just a story. It's fiction. And they know it. Yet here they are defending this erroneous belief, citing misinformation they know has just been debunked. And to me, this reveals so much about the underlying mechanisms behind motivated reasoning, selective skepticism, confirmation bias, disconfirmation bias, attitude bolstering, models of reality, and all those things that blend into the backfire effect. And the lesson, I think, is this. When correcting people, never leave that gap. If you set out to bust people's myths, big or small, without a plan, a really good, well-thought-out, informed-by-social-science plan that takes into account emotions and politics and everything else, if you don't have that plan for simultaneously replacing those myths that you're about to remove, you will do more harm than good.